Today on the Basketball Manitoba podcast, we have Bob Town. He is a graduate of Churchill High School, where he then went on to play at the University of Manitoba, where he was an All-Canadian and captain of the team in 1972. His excellence on the court led to his selection for the national team in 1972. Over the following five years, he represented Canada on the international stage, participating in prestigious events like the Pan Am Games in Mexico City, the World University Games in Moscow, and in 1976, he represented Canada at the Montreal Olympics. He also played for the St. Andrews Super Saints, where he achieved two national championships and was recognized as tournament all-star four times. In 1996, he was inducted into the Basketball Manitoba Hall of Fame. In 2009, the Manitoba High School Sports Hall of Fame. And in 2007, his 1976 Olympic team was inducted into the Canada Basketball Hall of Fame. Bob, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Darcy. So I have to start off by uh, sharing a story with you, um, just with regards to one of our recent guests. And so um, the episode... I mean, I guess it will have aired already, but um, Dean Pavoni, you came up on his podcast, oddly enough. And so, <laughs> you know, when I'm going to ask, you know, I asked him the, the standard questions about, you know, how we got into the game and everything. And he he mentioned you as one of the pivotal uh, people. Oddly enough, it wasn't because, you know, you mentored him or anything like that. It was simply because you told him to make a different decision. Um, and so I just kind of opened that up to uh, then also say, uh, that, um, you know, I, I played with your son, Sean, uh, at Glenlawn. I know Andrew very well, obviously played later with, you know, in senior men, he's a little younger, but the basketball community is, um, in Manitoba is a very tight niche one. And if you know someone, you know, kind of everybody. Um, and so I've known about you and remember when I was a high school kid, you even coming out and playing against us and everything like that. So you've been in the community for a long time. So it's an honor to have you, uh, on the podcast. Um, so thank you for taking the time. Uh, I'm very, very excited to, to hear more about your story. Cause I don't really know about your story. I just, I, I say all the, everything I said there is I know who you are. I know your sons. Um, I know obviously the, the bio I read, but, uh, haven't, uh, uh it's going to be cool to, to dig in and hear some more about exactly, um, how you journeyed through everything and your perspective. So appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Darcy. <laughs> so I got to ask the story about, before we go into your story, the, the story with Dean. So he, this, I'm actually not going to say anything. You tell me your perspective of how exactly uh, you ran into him and, and explain that story to us. Well, first of all, Dean Favoni is a really good guy. And uh, last night, unfortunately, his team uh, lost in the semifinals, in provincials, yes. which I was really sorry to see. He's a guy that deserves a chance, uh, deserves to win a provincial champion as a coach and as a person. Yeah. Um, what happened was, uh, my recollection is that uh, Dean had applied for a position. I was principal at Nelson McIntyre Collegiate, and we had a math position there. And uh, he actually had played for Ted Stowes, who was my best friend. And uh, we played together on the national team and with St. Well, at the University of Manitoba and with St. Andrew's Super Saints. And uh, so Ted had coached Dean, and Dean had come and applied for the job. And subsequently, uh, like Nelson Mack was the only high school in what was then Norwood School Division. Now it's part of, it became part of St. Boniface and then now Louis Riel School Division. So there was lots of opportunities now for teachers to move. But back then there were only seven schools in mm -hmm. Norwood School Division. So for Dean to accept a job at Nelson Mack, there wasn't, it was a very small school. There wasn't a lot of room for movement or, or anything. And he said he had an opportunity at, uh, at Dakota, and my recommendation was, you know, yeah, we'd love to have you. You'd be a great addition to our teaching staff and our coaching staff here at Nelson Mack, but for your own personal future, I recommended that he'd be better off to, to choose uh, Dakota, and he did, and he's gone on to have a great career there yes. as a coach and as yes. a teacher. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I, I think that I... I I wanted to hear your your perspective of it because he uh you started off by saying dean's a very nice guy which <laughs> everybody says that about dean it's true he's a very nice guy um but i think that just, it just shows the um the perspective like how important it, it is when you're it probably says a lot about you right i mean realistically you saw somebody who you could have said hey 
come here. I'm the principal here. I want the, you know, I want you to do this, but you saw something in him that, Hey, look, from a basketball perspective and this type of thing, if he goes over there, it's going to be, it's going to be a better fit for him. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I think I just thought, I thought it would just be an interesting way to kind of open up the podcast and cause I, he was telling the story and he was so grateful um, for, for you, for, for being that type of person that would actually yeah. say, Hey, what's best for, for him as a person. Right. And he's gone on to, you know, I think um they lost last night, but you know, he won one in, well, we talked about it 2004, I think when they upset Daniel yeah. Mack. Yeah. Yeah. So That's right. he, yeah, he's had a, he's had a great career, but nonetheless, we're not here to talk about Dean. Um, I want to hear more <laughs> about your story. Um, so I always typically ask this question just openly. Uh, what what's your first memory of of basketball? You know, How did you get involved in the game? Uh, you know, who showed you? Where were you? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question, and I, I guess I have a little bit of a story to tell with that. Uh, Let's hear it. Uh, my father uh, played basketball, and uh, he played at Central YMCA, and he played in what was then the intermediate league, and he played noon hour basketball and everything. But I was uh, probably, I'm guessing, five or six, maybe even younger. And my mother would take me down to Central YMCA and we would watch him play because the games were often there in the evening. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with Central Y and I haven't no. been there for, for many years, but there's a there used to be a track above the gymnasium, uh, the basketball court. And so my mom and I would sit up there and we'd watch the game. And uh, it was just uh, my first... I guess interest in the game was watching my dad and his teammates and the other teams play. And, and there were some, uh, some, some good players and some not so good players. <laughs> and uh, so it was, it, it was really interesting. And there were lots of players better than my dad. He was six, three and a half and he'd range from two thirty to two fifty. different body build than mine. And, mm. uh, and he was a physical player, uh, not a finesse player. But that was the first uh, first kind of thing that I – first recollection that I have of basketball. And it's funny because later, not that many years later, I was playing high school at Churchill High. And uh, I remember my dad – like I would have been 16, 17, I guess in grade 12. And mm -hmm. my dad was still playing at the Y. And, and I thought, what's he doing? Like he's in his 30s. <laughs> he's not that good, you know. And I thought I was pretty really good, of course, by then. And I would just kind yeah, of think, yeah. uh, why is he still playing? And it, it took a few more years before I realized, well, of course he's playing because he loves to play. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and I mean, you love to play. I love to play. And it's all the things about the game that the camaraderie, the, the feel of the ball, you know, the, yeah. the, the feel of the ball going through the hoop, you're, you know, the okay. teammates. Uh, you know, it's just so many things. And so it took a while before I realized uh, how my dad uh, felt. And and and, and, and <laughs> silly enough, uh, you know, my dad was in his 40s probably when he quit. And, I mean, I stopped playing about five years ago. Uh, my <laughs> yeah. body just said, this is silly. I'm just going <laughs> to hurt myself. And so, um, yeah. So, anyway, that was my, my start with basketball was certainly watching it at the Y Yep. And then later, you know, playing at the Y. I, back then, you couldn't join the YMCA as a kid until you were ten years old. Okay. Like there were no no programs for for children under ten. And uh, so, in the first couple of years, it was just you know low organized games and swimming, of course, and stuff. Uh, and then once I was twelve, then I could play basketball. And of course, then I also started playing at uh, Churchill High in grade seven in junior high. Churchill mm -hmm. was a great, still is a great seven to 12 school. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that was yeah. sort of my start. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's uh, interesting to hear you kind of compare your father playing in, in his forties and you being like, what's going on here. And then you kind of flipped in there casually. Yeah. I just kind of stopped playing five years ago. My body said enough, but I, I have to ask just so the people that are listening and watching, um, how old were you five years ago when you stopped playing? Well, I would have been uh, sixty nine, I guess. Okay. <laughs> you were, and this is, and the reason why I bring this up is because you know most people um, stop playing the game a long time, well before that. You know, maybe into yeah. their, playing into your fifties would be, hey, yeah. that's amazing. You know, and so for you, um, I have a good friend of mine, uh, Graham Bodner, who obviously comes up a lot in this podcast, but I think he's he wants what you did, you know, he wants to play until he literally can't play anymore. Yeah. Um, and so it's a kind of a little bit of a tangent, but um, 
I have to ask, like, I know you're a phenomenal athlete. I mean, again, you've been, you were gifted with that. And, and, and even when I remember when I was young and you were the gym, in the gym playing, I was like, this old guy is amazing. And again, at the time you were only in your like, you know, probably late forties, but, but the point I'm, I think I want to ask you here is what, like, is there anything that you did particularly to be able to keep playing to that point? Cause most people say, Oh, my knees are too sore. My back's too sore. I can't play. I'm old. I just can't do it. What did, what did you do? Well, I think a lot of it is genetics. I was just really fortunate to be uh, <laughs> to be a, the kind of body that I have, and uh, but I, I was uh, again really fortunate that uh, when I did go to the YMCA, I, I it's hard to believe that I was in, in in the gym gymnastics club and I did oh. gymnastics, and I think that's something I would really recommend is for for uh, athletes just the body awareness and and uh, trying to be. Uh, flexible not that i am but you know mm -hmm. just try to be flexible and be fit uh, actually one of the members of the gymnastics club that i was with was a fellow by the name of keith carter and uh, he was shorter and more of a gymnastics build but in the 76 olympics when i played he was there in oh, gymnastics wow. competing for canada so there it's kind go. of a kind of a neat thing yeah. but i also used to do the other thing i guess i always feel really strongly about and it and it i think it's changed it a little bit there's so many parents that want their children to succeed and they play them in one sport yeah and then it's just you, you get overused whether it's volleyball they get mm -hmm. shoulder injuries mm -hmm. you know what, whatever it, it, i think that's just a mistake uh, i think there's such a trend uh there's a transfer of of abilities from one sport to another and and when I think of the players, well, like I think of my boys, both excellent athletes. They played racket sports. They played volleyball. They played basketball. You know, they did all kinds of things and, and were successful. And I think it helped them be successful in university and, and, mm -hmm. and to reach those things. I think of a guy like Martin O'Reilly, like he didn't just play basketball. He played sports and stuff. And And for me, my health, part of it is fitness, part of it's genetics, certainly. But I also ran a lot, so I, I think mm. that helped me be successful at, at, to make teams is because I was fit. Mm -hmm. and, and back then, it was a little different than now when you've got all these people doing these training regimen, yeah. regimes and, and stuff like that. So so that was positive for me. I was pretty fortunate that way. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, to be to, to quit playing in your 60s, I mean, is, uh, is a feat in itself. So uh, one more question on this. So if you... Like what is when you were playing? What is your day to day fitness like? Are, were you a big walker? Are you a big walker? Do you do anything else besides play basketball that just keeps you kind of moving, keeps everything, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I still I I walk a lot. Uh, just recently, my wife and I joined the Dakota, Dakota Community Center. We used to go to the refit, but with yeah. the pandemic, that stopped. But I think just try to remain fit and active as best as I can uh, mm -hmm. uh, is, is what I've always, always done. And uh, you talk about 69 I and mean, I wanted to play till I was at least 70 because uh, <laughs> this uh, St. Andrews, there was a group that used to play at Ra Ravens court on Sunday mornings mm -hmm. and Kenny Plain actually was part of that group. And uh, he was 14 years older than me. And he was an icon as we know, and just a fantastic individual and tough as nails uh, on the court, you know, especially if you, know, you crossed them and you, and you thought you <laughs> fouled them and you didn't call it. <laughs> but but a really good guy. But he was there still playing, and, and he probably was playing, probably was close to 70. And then I don't know if you would know Bob Hazel. Uh, of course. But, yeah. but he, he was playing in his 70s, and he coached, yeah. he coached me with St. Andrews. And actually, yeah. he helped me coach both – Sean and Andrew in basketball at junior high. He was mm -hmm. uh, that kind of a guy that just loved basketball and went out of his way to, yeah. to coach and help kids become better. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, me I remember uh, the Hayes, as we used to call him. He helped uh, yeah. he helped coach a few of the my last years there. And uh, uh, I remember one time he came out to the Glenlawn alumni like he's playing. And he came with the super tiny shorts and he was out there playing. And I was, I, I couldn't, I could not believe it. Yeah. You know, being a, yeah. when you're, when you're young, uh, you know, nothing. Right. And you only find that out later when you're older. Yeah. Like, oh, I knew nothing. And, and to see somebody of that age, just 
out there playing. And he again, there's no, it wasn't like he was a phenomenal athlete, but he was running up and down the court. He was playing and, basketball, and that was yeah. just un unbelievable at the yeah. time. Yeah, well, and he was a smart player. That was the yes. thing. If you didn't know where he was, he moved to an open spot, got the yeah. ball, shot yeah. it, and made it. You know, yeah, he was yeah. a good shooter. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, okay, let's jump back into your story though. So you, you get involved in playing the game uh, through watching your your father. Those are some of your first memories of watching him play at the, the downtown Y and. And some of those those games there. When did you start? You said at Churchill, you started playing in the in the seventh grade. Um, and then was it just pretty much from there on in? I know you played a bunch of other sports, but with basketball, I guess the question I have is when did you start to take it more seriously? Where you said, "Hey, I'm pretty good at this. I like it," and um, you know, I'm I'm actually playing it on a more um, uh, serious level, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Well, as you say, grade seven, I guess, 12 years of age, I already knew that I liked the game and it was fun. I enjoyed playing. It was something I was good at. So you, you feel better about yourself when you're somewhat successful. Of course. Of and course. Uh, so in grade 11 and, uh, you know, Art Bryant coached me when I was in grade 11. I was, you know, Paul Bryant's dad. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and he was just a really good guy. And uh, and I got some playing time and everything. And I think one of the things that happened was at the end of the school year, they have awards. And I was very surprised to win a Most Improved Player Award. Mm -hmm. And I think that really kind of got me going. And uh, so then the next year, we had a good team, which was made up mostly of of grade 11s with John Laven and guys like Jamie Horn and uh, uh, and they were really good uh, good athletes and, and and smart players um, and we didn't do as well as we would have liked we ended up losing in the playoffs to St John's uh, High School who had some very good players um, so so that was kind of disappointed but so that was my grade 12 year and I graduated and I was an okay player but I wasn't a great player. And back then there were no scholarships and mm -hmm. no universities calling you to, to say, oh, come here, come there, you know. And, and even if there would have been, I don't know that I would have been <laughs> recognized at all. But that summer was the summer of the 67 Pan Am Games. Mm. And my parents uh, volunteered and they had me volunteer as well. And oddly enough, uh, Ted Stowe's, uh, who's my, one of my best friends, uh, he was also volunteered the game. So we volunteered in the basketball thing and we weren't at the actual venue. We were, well, we were doing things like photocopying stats and stuff like that. Okay, so, yeah. and, but we did get to see the games. And I think that was the biggest thing for me uh, was, was seeing the Pan Am games, seeing the Canadian team, all these athletes, uh, the U S had like Wesley Unseld at the time. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, just watching them, that was probably the key for me to say to myself, you know, I'd like to do that. I'd like to represent Canada. I want to be good, as good as I can be, and hopefully get a chance to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think having games like that, like in 67, and then again in 99, makes a huge difference, not just yeah. difference, not just for basketball, but for other sports, for athletes, for, for them to see this and to think, Boy, that's that's an opportunity. It, it allows a person to dream and mm. to set goals. And for me, that was that was the big thing. Was in '67 that happening? And uh, and 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 I was fortunate. The next year, I went on to university, and uh, the year before, which would have been Ross's uh, Ross Wedlake's first year. Uh, the team was one in 19. Uh, I think <laughs> yeah. I, I know I saw the podcast with him. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 uh, and and there were some good players and stuff. It was just whatever. And and, and so my first year, um, we had a good team. Uh, I didn't play a lot, but I played a little bit. And, uh, you know, it, it, was, it just kind of grew from there. I just loved the game and uh, loved to play and was really fortunate to play with guys like Ross and Ted Stowes and Irv Hanek and uh, just, uh, you know, a variety of, uh, of players uh, that, that – help make me better mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. yeah i know that's I, I i i totally appreciate how a big event like the pan am games completely can inspire uh especially young people right like to see you know maybe i can do that or i can do something like that um or sometimes it's just maybe just being wanting to be just more involved in a sport right you yeah. you see how special it is to participate in these 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 events and 
um, you know, I've been at, at some of these events and it's just, there's a level of like, you get the, the feeling that you get, right. It's a, right. a sense of yeah. something special happening and how yeah. powerful it can be. And so I totally, yeah. totally understand what you're saying. So then when you're, th- that's in 67, you had graduated, you had mentioned, Hey, there's no, you know, scholarships, nothing like that. You already knew that you were going to the university of Manitoba as a student at the time. Correct. Yeah. Okay. I, I was, I went, to, uh, I was, because of my experience in the YMCA and I worked part-time there and had access to the gym. And uh, actually when I was in grade 12, uh, I opened the gym for John Kutnikoff, who was the uh, coach at Simon Fraser at the time. And there were about, uh, I'm going to say 15 to 20 players that it was a Saturday morning and I came in, opened the gym and here were these guys like Ross Wedlick and Ted Stowe's and, Jaime Fox and and all these and, and a bunch of other players that John Kutnikoff was trying to recruit to go to Simon Fraser. Okay. So I'm sitting in the gym watching these guys and I'm saying to myself, like, where do I fit into this? Like, am I as good as them? You know, and and being a a kid, you know, and you think you know it all. Of course, you think, yeah, I could play with these guys. You know, why aren't I out there on the floor? Yeah, but of yeah. course, you're not, you know. And uh, so that was kind of an interesting experience. But my my whole thing through the YMCA, which was a fantastic experience for me, that made me want to go into the University of Manitoba phys- physical education program. Okay. Because at the time, I thought, you know, I'd like to go back and work at the YMCA, uh, you know. But of course, once I started going through uh, phys ed at University of Manitoba, I realized, you know what? If you're a teacher, you get paid a whole lot more money than you do at the YMCA. <laughs> <laughs> so that was sort of that was sort of the start. Okay. But, uh, but in 1969, um, there was a development camp. Like basketball in Canada still was was not nearly as strong as it is today. Mm-hmm. And 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 so in 1969, there was a development camp where there were 24 people, uh, 24 men, 24 women that were invited to University of Manitoba to try out. And they were going to select people to go to Hamilton, to McMaster University for two weeks, and train for two weeks with Canadians across you know, Canada under the age of, of 20 or 21, whatever it was at that time. And uh, I had a really good summer job uh, uh, as a recreation uh, director at, at this community and uh, I had to make a choice and and, and because I had this goal I, I, I thought well I want to go to Hamilton I want but I've got to make this team and I might not make it or it might not be selected I should say so I quit the recreation job and uh, tried out and uh, actually was selected to go to Hamilton along with uh, Ross Wedlake and Ted Stowe's and Angus Burr and there were then all kinds of people from across Canada. But one day I was in an elevator. It was the same summer, and I was uh, going to an appointment. And this gentleman said to me, introduced himself, and he was on the uh, board of the recreation center that I quit the job. Okay. And, and, and he explained to me, he said, uh, you know, I know you want to do this, he said, but uh, and, and just paraphrasing what he said but you know i was involved with the pan am games in 67 and i think you're making a big mistake you're not you're not going to make a, a big splash in basketball you're not going to make a make a national team i've oh, seen hey. the caliber of players and, and and you know i just stood there and listened to him i mean i was respectful because he was a mm-hmm. an, an elder and, and i thought you don't know me you, you don't know what i can do and it Put a little chip on my shoulder, which probably wasn't a bad thing to have, but it really upset me that he had this preconceived notion about who I was and how good I could be. Um, anyway, ended up going to the Hamilton camp uh, for two weeks, uh, um, and the actually the national team was training there at that time with Peter Mullins, and uh, so there would have been, I'm guessing, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 males uh, that were at this two week camp. And, uh, so the national team that was tr- training there, they selected a dozen people, Ted and Ross and, and, uh, Angus and I were part of the 12 to play against an exhibition game against the national team. So that was a pretty neat experience for, for all of us. 
Yeah, because uh, we were pretty young still back then, and and there were some pretty good players, obviously, on the national team. Uh, and then when the camp, the the development camp ended in in uh, '69, Peter Mullins asked me to stay and train with the national team. So that was the first op- opportunity I had with the national team, and uh, and and and. And I was just a kid, and, and there were men there, uh, and, and guys that could play, and and I was over my head. But it was a, it was it was a good experience, nonetheless. And uh, uh, and then the following year in 1970, there was uh, a national team camp at University of Manitoba, and there were a bunch of us there: Ted Ross, uh, Angus, uh, Terry Ball, who was a really really good mm-hmm. player, and. Uh, so we had this trial camp again with Peter Mullins, and then the following year was the '71 uh, uh, Pan Am Games in Cali, Colombia, and so the national camp was in BC because Peter Mullins was the UBC coach and the national team coach. So Ted Stowes made that Cali, Colombia Pan Am team. I was an alternate, so I didn't get to go or anything, and and that was uh, that was a bit disheartening at that point. But I realized, well, I have to get better, so. Anyway, but just my years at University of Manitoba playing for the Bisons, I just have to say uh, my first year was with uh, Darwin Simodiak, who was uh, had just gotten out of university himself. And I know Ross had mentioned that yeah. the one, one win that they had was against yeah. Darwin's team. But Darwin Simodiak only coached one year at University of Manitoba. And he was just a, a classy guy, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and knew basketball and, uh, and he was a good coach, and his assistant coach was Freddie Ingleson, who was a phenomenal b- uh, basketball player for for Manitoba. And Freddie uh, and and Darwin did a really good job with that team, uh, and we did very well. Uh, but then the following year, uh, Darwin left for uh, Western University and and, uh, mm. and was there for many years and passed away a couple of years ago, unfortunately. But uh, so Jack Lewis came in, and mm-hmm. and Jack. Uh, Coached for for four years, I guess, and, and 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 our team did very well. And he recruited a couple of Americans. Uh, Cliff Cornelius and John Gerben came up. Cliff was just for one year. He came out of Nebraska. He played played four years down there, and John came from Minneapolis, and uh, and he stayed and played here for many years, both university and and then also senior men's before going back to Minneapolis, uh, but. Uh, yeah, Jack. Jack did a really good job. And in, in 1971, we were in the national final and mm-hmm. and uh, lost to Acadia. Uh, very few losses that year, but lost to Acadia in the final. What was then the Golden Boy, the Westman Classic. Now it's called. But uh, mm-hmm. and then lost to them. Then they played a one-three-one zone that we, you know, we just <laughs> couldn't figure out. Couldn't 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 do anything with it. It was yeah. uh, it was too bad because I. It's funny, you know, there's losses like that. And then the next year, in my last year of university, we lost to Saskatchewan in, uh, in a best of three. We won the first game here at home, lost the second, and then lost the third and, and should have won it. I mean, it's the losses that you you remember. The, you know, that's the worst memories, unfortunately. But those are the ones you remember, it seems like. So, yeah, anyway. yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. So then, um, so many questions from this. So um, when you were at University of Manitoba in your first couple of years, you were, you know, the young guy on the team. But by the end of your career, you were kind of one of the, well, you were a captain and and, and kind of a leader. So how much of it, obviously, you know, you know, you know, you mentioned the national team experiences, being able to come to those camps and stuff like that. Um, but you really developed in those in those years from uh, you know, a player who, hey, I don't play that much to so someone who's who's playing a lot. And then for pretty much, you know, um, right after you're done playing, you kind of transfer into, you know, getting opportunities with the national team. And so it's it was pretty much an ascension from the high school where you're like, yeah, I was okay, pretty good, to like being, you know, an all-Canadian, a captain, you know, an Olymp- like essentially an Olympian. So it's like this this trajectory. But in that time, you, you must have had some some mentors, some people that I really helped guide you. And I know you brought some of them up, but maybe some of the, those lessons you learned from being somebody in high school, I don't really know as much, you know, I'm kind of just here. I'm, 
I'm learning, I'm trying to absorb as much information as possible to being the person that, you know, is it is an Olympian, you learn a lot of lessons that kind of help guide you. So maybe, you know, who were some of those people who are really critical in, in shaping you um, through that process? And maybe some of the, the lessons that you then passed on to people uh, when you were now mentoring people? Well, I, I think I was very fortunate for sure, because the people that I played with at the University of Manitoba um, mentioned Cliff Cornelius, uh, Ted Stowes, Ross Wedlake, uh, uh, John Laven, uh, Angus Burr, uh, Irv Hannick, uh, the older guys when I first got there, Eric Bartz. Um, because you would practice, you know, you got better in practice all the time. Um, it, it just was uh, Terry Ball. I, I forget Terry, Irv Hannick, I think maybe mentioned. These are These were guys who were really not just good basketball players, but they were quality individuals. And, and, and that made a huge difference, I think, as well, um, because it just it, it helped you grow, not just uh, athletically, but as a person. Um, and, and Jack Lewis, I mentioned, I mean, <clears throat> he was a guy who uh, he was so supportive to individuals, not just the team, but other people in the in the physical education faculty, the things that the stories that that I've heard from my friends, the stuff that I didn't realize that he had done for them mm. to help them to be successful, uh, to, you know, financially be able to get through university, stuff like that. Uh, uh, he actually, Jack had, uh, when they were building the Commerce Building at the University of Manitoba, so that's what, back in 69, I guess, 70 in, in that area, era, um, he got Ross Wedlake, myself, uh, Angus Burr, and Richard Gooch jobs on construction there. So I remember we were making $3.20 an hour, <laughs> which I know doesn't sound like much, but back then that was huge money, oh, yeah. uh, you know, with, with everything going on. But we would finish uh, working, and then we would go to the gym. And somehow, I can't remember how, but somehow we had a key to get in the gym. I don't know what that was about. <laughs> but, uh, so we would go into Bison East, and, and, and that was a fantastic building to play basketball in. Oh. And we would, and we would, you know, after working from you know eight to three o'clock or whatever it was, then we'd spend another hour, hour and a half, two hours shooting hoops and playing one on one or two on two, and and those were the things I think that helped us become better players like all of us. And, and certainly for me playing against uh, better players. Uh, I remember mm -hmm. one time playing one-on-one -on -one with Terry ball and, and I don't know how well you, how much you know about Terry ball, but Terry ball could score like nobody left-handed quick as can be. He had this triple move that he used and I was trying to play defense and he would just kick the heck out of me. You know, like, you know I, there's no way I could beat him, but it made me a better player. Mm -hmm. and, 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 mm -hmm. and I think that was important. Uh, um, you know, I mean, guys like Bob Hazel, uh, and I, when, like when I finished university and played with St. Andrews, uh, you know, he certainly uh, was a big help in, in my game. Uh, uh, Peter Mullen, Mullins at uh, UBC. Uh, but then when Jack Donahue came on the scene, uh, and, and that was the first year that I really made the team, uh, he, he was um, he was a really interesting coach. And uh, <laughs> he he did wonders for basketball in Canada. That's, yeah. that's for sure. You know? oh, yeah, big time, big time. He coached, yeah, you hear it. The name is, uh, yeah, the well-renowned people who don't know who he is know the name even you know what i mean like young people like yeah. oh, i've heard that name before yeah but what yeah. um so your first year was his first year when you first made the team was, was that his yes, first uh, year yeah, yeah yeah okay i guess just to go back to like like i feel like i was really fortunate and i was mentored well because of people i played with I, people that coached me um quality individuals unfortunately i don't know that i mentored very well and when I was in my, my last year, I, I feel really badly that I didn't think that I did the job that was necessary for us to go on. And because uh, mm -hmm. we had some really good players like Rick Watts, mm -hmm. Daryl Rumsey, um, Greg Gillies, uh, Ralph Schoenfeld, who played for the Bombers and he mm -hmm. played for us for the Bisons, uh, Gordy Putter to uh, Angus, of course. Uh, like we had, you know, John Gerber, we had really good players and 
and it was disappointing that we didn't go on. And 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 I, as I say, you remember the losses more than yeah. anything, and, yeah. and that was that was unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, no, hundred yeah. percent. Um, I think some of those guys later on that uh, you know obviously went on to have uh, great careers. Feel the yeah, feel the deal yeah. and have great careers. But yeah. I, I something I got to ask you. You mentioned Roth is the uh, podcast. So you, you you listen to it, but the topic came up in a conversation that he uh, and I had, and I <laughs> was around um, salt tablets and post and pregame recovery and things of that nature. What do you remember about about that during your time? <laughs> Well, yeah, back then, you know, lots of teams, they, they said, you know, you don't drink water, you know, you shouldn't be drinking water. It's just going to make you feel badly when you're playing, when you're running and whatever. And uh, it's so different than the whole concept of hydrating now. And uh, yeah, the tablets, there was, uh, there were these other ones, uh, sort of like not a sugar pill, but that you, that you would take to, to try to give you energy, I guess. Or, I mm-hmm. don't know. It was just, but uh Back then, there wasn't all that much weight training or yeah. those that kind of any training that you did, you did on your own, and mm. uh, and it was some and and back then, as John Laven would say, like they would say, you know, well, no, you shouldn't do weights because that's going to ruin your shot. You yeah, know, you're going to yeah. get muscle bound. Or whatever. Well, yeah. there was no chance of me getting muscle bound, <laughs> but I maybe could have gotten stronger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, no, it's it, it's interesting how I think the things have changed considerably. A lot, yeah. a lot. I mean, even when I like again, I graduated in 2000, and I remember people still kind of saying those things about working out. Like it was still, you know, like yeah. it was still in the ether. You know, people were doing it, but people say, oh, you know, it affects my shot. And it's interesting because obviously if you get like be a a bodybuilder size, yeah, you're going to probably shoot differently. Uh But the thing that I would remember and I said, oh, it must be true is because if you go right from the gym and you pump a bunch of weight and you're not trained yet, like you're not like a a trained person and you try to shoot the ball, you're so fatigued, you can't shoot. And so people are like, yeah, it's true. See, I. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No, (laughs) things have changed, fortunately, for the better. Yeah, Yeah, 100%. So I wanted to continue down the path of the national team because obviously you said you finally made the team. Uh, We know that you were in Montreal. Um, Tell me about how you actually got onto the team. Was it just, hey, you know, they're they're having trials all the time and you're always part of them and you just happen to make the team? Do you remember that year and the transition that was made? Well, I guess what happened was, well, in 72, uh, our Bison team lost to Saskatchewan, as I said. So we didn't advance, which was really disappointing. Now, St. Andrews and and Ross and Ted and, and a lot of Bison guys, they, they were playing in the national championships in Vancouver. So I couldn't play with them because I was a university player. They were, I wasn't eligible. But they invited me to go to Vancouver with them because after the Nationals, they were going to go to Cuba to play in Cuba. They had a five-game series down in Cuba against the Cuban national team and uh, the, the Cuban junior national team. So I went to uh, Vancouver and watch St. Andrews and they won the national championship and they had a really good team with Ross and Ted and, uh, Irv Hanek, Frank Evans, who was coach of U of W at the time was playing. And, uh, Freddie Ingleson was coaching them. There's a fellow by the name of Jerome Barney, who was an American, uh, black guy, big guy, really good post, uh, and, and they had other players that were, were good as well. Dave Mills, uh, Tim Rupel, um, Jaime Fox was on that team. Anyway, I went and watched them play. They won the national championship, and then the team went to Cuba. So I went to Cuba because Ray McCall couldn't go because he was with some stuff going on with university and stuff. And so that was really a great experience for me because we played against the Cuban national team. And and, and I started, even though I wasn't part of the team, really. <laughs> and and we had a we, we were really good. And Cuba was a very good team. They'd done really well. Uh, and and, uh, and we gave them a pretty good run for their money. We beat their junior team, uh, national junior team. So that was a great experience. And there was a fellow from Basketball Canada at the time that was on the trip with St. Andrews, one of those little perks that the directors get, you know. So he <laughs> yeah, came yeah. to Cuba with us. And when we came back home, they had uh, they had this plan to ha- send – 
five players from Canada to Europe and, and have them experience playing in Europe. And because this fellow was on this trip and he saw me play and, and I ended up being invited along with Ted Stowes to go to Europe. The other three players were Terry Mackay from UBC and they'd won the champion national championship, Alex Braden, another from UBC, and then Billy Robinson, who played for many years for the national team, and he was from Simon Fraser. So the five of us went over to Europe, and a fellow by the name of Jim McGregor, he, he was their contact, and he was an agent kind of guy, and he ran a team over there called the Gillette All-Stars, <laughs> and it was made up of all American players who graduated from university and weren't making the NBA at that yeah. time. So he would have this traveling team called the Gillette All-Stars, and they would play in Italy and France and Sweden and, and Yugoslavia, all over the place. And uh, what his goal was, was for the teams, these Division I teams that were being played in all these countries, to see these American players and then he would get them jobs. So Got they would it. play yes, in Spain or Italy or France. And then he would get a cut, of course, because he was the agent. And so that was what he did. So the five of us played with a few Americans, and we traveled and played for, uh, for four or five weeks, I guess, over there. So that was kind of my first experience at that level. And, and to be honest with you, I mean, back then, like it was phenomenal. Like the like Division One in Italy and in Spain was very very good basketball, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and the difference between that that and the NBA, I mean now there's all kinds of European players playing in the of NBA, and and I think there probably were lots that could have back then, but maybe they've just progressed so much. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So at the end of that uh, six weeks, we came back home, and there had been a camp here in uh, in well across the. In all the provinces, there were camps that Jack Donahue ran to select players to go to a, a final camp. And Ted and I had missed it because we were in Europe. And so Ross and Angus were selected. And because we were away and we were doing this thing with Canada basketball, we were also allowed to go or selected to go. So Got we it. went to Court, Courtney, BC, and that was Jack Donahue's first camp with, and I, I'm guessing there were maybe 50 of us there. And the, the idea was there were going to be two national teams, an A and a B team. <clears throat> and the A team would go to Europe and travel, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and play some uh, some tournaments and stuff and then play in a pre-Olympic tournament to qualify for, for Munich. That would be a pre-Olympic trial and three or four teams were going to go on to Munich. Anyway, the other, the B team, would go to China and play in China. So there were about 50 of us there in Courtney, B.C. We stayed in this school, and you got these beds in these school rooms, these classrooms. <laughs> yeah. And there's this gym, which was a pretty nice gym. You know, it was a hardwood floor, of course, and everything. But we had three-a-days. And three-a-days are tough. Yeah. And again, I, I go back to that. <clears throat> that had to help me because I was always pretty fit. I yes. was a runner. I used to run cross country and track and stuff. And so you, you talk about three a days, but the reality is it's not just the like, okay, practice starts at nine, you know, goes to 1030. What well, you got to be out there by at yeah. least 845, warm it up or cause you're going to die. You know, everybody else is going to be warm. So you're putting in lots of hours in those three a days. And, and so after two weeks, there was the selection and, you know, it was, it, it, I remember it was pretty uh, worrisome because, you know, I'm with my good friends, Ross and Ted and Angus, and you want everybody, you know, you're hoping you're going to make the team. Yeah. And so Ross and Ted and I made the 70, the, the, the A team and Angus went to China with the B team. And, uh, and that was a fun experience. I'll tell you, we went over and we played in, uh, in Europe and uh, played on uh, in Italy. And then, played in Augsburg and against these other national teams. And unfortunately, again, we didn't qualify for, for Munich, uh, which was, which was too bad. Um, but that was my first experience. And then I, I was finished university and, and so was Ted, um, had a chance for a job in, uh, 
in Winnipeg teaching, but uh, Ted and I had decided that we were going to stay and play for the Gillette All-Stars. Oh, so no we, tra- we, we traveled, uh, played for this so-called professional traveling team from September to December and played in uh, all, you know, played in all, all over Europe uh, yeah. you know, and, and just had a, a really good experience with it. Uh, um, actually, I had a chance to, to play uh, Division Two in Nice in France, uh, I was offered a, a, a contract there. But by this time, I was, you know, it was December. I'd been away for almost, uh, you know, three quarters of the year. I was ready to go home, mm-hmm. so so went home, and uh, that ended that. And uh, and then there were tryouts in '73, uh, and that was in Winnipeg actually, and uh, uh, that was for the uh, World Student Games, and. You know, you talk about uh, world championships, which I never got a chance to play in. That was in 74, unfortunately. But when you play in a multi-sport game, like a mm-hmm. World University Games or Pan Am Games or Canada Games even, or, you know, or the Olympics, it's such a different experience playing and meeting all these other athletes from all these other sports. So it was, uh, you know, it was really phenomenal. So anyway, in 73... Uh, Rick Watts and I made the team, and uh, Martin Riley uh, was just out of high school, so he made the national team, <laughs> oh, but, he wow. couldn't, but he couldn't play in the university games because he wasn't a university student. Oh, wow. <laughs> so when we played in Moscow, he he and, and a couple of other players had to wait for us, and then we traveled and played some more. But we we played, before that, we played in uh, Poland and England and Czechoslovakia and uh, and that was a phenomenal experience. Uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story here. I, I'm probably talking too much. No, no, this is it. Like this, let's go. I'm, this is this is the, the, what you're doing is perfect. Let's keep going. <laughs> I so, love it. So so Martin and uh, Rick Watts and, and I were playing. Uh, you know, and we're playing in Czechoslovakia. And, and there's one day it's a shoot around, mm-hmm. and so you know you got. And so we all change into our gear, you know, we're in our shorts and our tops, our practice tops, and, and we're shooting around. We got half the gym. The other half of the gym is uh, the United States team, the Americans. Yeah. And they they got their their runners on, their sneakers, but but they're in their blue jeans and their, you know, whatever, T-shirt or whatever, and they're at the other end. So we're running some sh- plays and shooting the ball and stuff. And And I have to tell you, this American team was maybe the best team that I've ever played against. And, uh, and, and I played against lots of NBA players, you know, like phenomenal players, but we're looking at the other end. We're trying, well, what the heck are they doing down there? And they're all kind of standing around and couldn't figure out what they were doing. So on this team is David Thompson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure if you know, like David yeah. Thompson oh, yeah. was the first Michael Jordan. Yes. Yes. Like he could dunk. I think he lost to Michael Jordan in the dunk contest, the very first dunk contest. But he could do. He was phenomenal, and he was a little shorter than I was. But mm-hmm. could he leap? He was just unbelievable. So we look at the other end, and here's these guys, and here's David Thompson, and he's got the ball, and he's running up to the hoop, and he's got the ball tucked in his arm like this, <laughs> and he's going up, and he's going to try to punch it in to dunk the ball. Like, <laughs> like you, you know, you got to get shoulders yeah, you up above. Up. You got to yeah. get your shoulders above the rim to do that. And, and yeah. this guy's six four. You know. Uh, anyway, it was it was unbelievable watching him do that. And uh, but on that team was a uh, number of players from that uh, Indiana team that uh, Bobby Knight coached that went mm-hmm. undefeated. Uh, Quinn mm-hmm. Buckner, Scott May. And a fellow by the name of Maurice Lucas. I don't mm-hmm. know if you would know that name. Like, of course, yeah. He was course. he was one of the toughest guys. You know, and he played, all these guys played in the NBA. There was Marvin Barnes, who was a, yeah. a yeah. wee bit of a head case. But uh, <laughs> talented player. Scary guy, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, so we played in the uh, university games uh, in Moscow. Uh, Rick, unfortunately, hurt his knee. First game uh, we play, I was on the bench, but I was the first sub in and I was pumped and, you know, you just get in, you go up, get a rebound, come down, landed on a guy's foot and dislocated oh, the ball of my foot. Like, you know, no way. The, the ball joined in my foot, just totally dislocated. And, and no that, way. that was a problem. And I, you know, for, for a year it was, you know, it, it just takes so long for those kinds of injuries yeah. to, 
And I think it, that's my excuse for not making the 74 team. <laughs> <laughs> valid <laughs> excuse. That's a valid reason. Yeah. Valid reason. But, uh, so then in 75 was the Pan Am team and, uh, we played in Mexico and we didn't, we didn't play very well there. And it was disappointing. Uh, let me go back to 72. Uh, that year, I guess Canada already knew they were going to host the 76 Olympics. Yeah, yeah. And so that was a, that was pretty exciting. So you knew you were going to be in it. You didn't have to qualify or anything. Usually mm-hmm. you have to qualify for the Olympics, but as the host team, host country, you, you, you didn't have to. Uh, but, for Montreal, like I remember thinking, geez, I want to play in the Olympics, but I want to play somewhere else. You know, I, I don't want yeah, to yeah, play yeah. my home country. Yes. I'd like to go yeah, somewhere, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But meanwhile, in 73, I was in Moscow. In 75, I was in Mexico City. And yeah. uh, I always call it the three M's, you know, and, <laughs> and then <laughs> Montreal in 76. And boy, I was so wrong yeah. about playing at home. Like one of the most uh, amazing feelings as the host country at the, at the opening ceremonies, everybody, like the Olympic Village was, I don't know, about a mile and a half from the uh, Olympic Stadium. And so all the countries line up outside in their wardrobe, you know, and they're all dressed in their uh, country colors and everything. So each team enters the stadium and the Olympic Stadium is open at the top. Mm-hmm. So you can hear the announcer, you know, and they're saying from Antigua, you know, from yeah. Brazil, you know, yeah. and the crowds cheering and everything. And being the host country, uh, yeah, I still get emotional. Of course. <laughs> um, we're the, the last country to come in. So we come in and, you know, everybody stands up. So it was phenomenal. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, it was such a good experience. It was so neat to, uh, to be representing Canada. Yeah. It, it was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <The> understatement. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, I mean, I, again, I, I hope you can, I hope you can edit that out. <laughs> yeah. No, I, you know what? I, uh, anyway, yeah. we, I was, it was a phenomenal experience and, uh, just to represent Canada all those years and wear the maple leaf, uh, listen to the national anthem, uh, it was uh, it was a dream come true, you know. Yeah. It was just fantastic. Uh, yeah. Again, you you remember the losses more than the wins. Uh, we we were in a pool that uh, the top two teams. There's two pools. Top two teams advance, mm-hmm. and uh, we lost to Russia. Uh, we'd only beaten them once the year before in '75 in uh, Maple Leaf Gardens. We played them, and that was the only time in my tenure that we ever beat Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, so we finished second in our pool, which was what our goal was to get into the next. So all we had to do was win one more game. Our goal from 72 on was to win a, a, a win a medal. Mm-hmm. So um, unfortunately, we played, uh, because we finished second, we would play the Americans first. And we played the Americans about two, three weeks before in Plattsburgh, uh, in, uh, in New York uh, State and and. Uh, uh, and gave them a pretty good game. I think we lost by 12. But Ken McKenzie was uh, was our, our center, big 6'10", tough guy. He played at Montana State. And uh, in the game, he landed and tore mm-hmm. his knee up. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't able to play in the Olympics, which was really unfortunate because he was a tough guy, big rebounder, and he could mm-hmm. score, left-handed guy. So that was too bad. So when we played the... Uh, Americans uh, in, in the semifinal, uh, they had guys like Phil Ford, uh, Mitch Kupchak, uh, Ernie Grunfeld. Kupchak and Grunfeld, they went on to be general managers for NBA. Yeah. Teams and <laughs> yeah, play- yeah. Well, first of all, they played in NBA and yes. stuff. So they had lots of really, really good players. And they, they beat us pretty handily. Uh, so, I mean, some of us, I think, if not most of us, were hoping that Russia would beat Yugoslavia. In the mm. other semifinal, because we thought we matched up not too badly against Yugoslavia, whereas Russia was, they were pretty tough. Yeah. But unfortunately, uh, Yugoslavia beat Russia. So then we had to play in the bronze medal game against Russia. Uh, and again, you know, and unfortunately, we lost, finished fourth, uh, which is, I guess, okay, but it's not a medal. And so, yeah. so it was disappointing. And uh, I remember uh, 
a few of us after the game, um, they have drug testing, eh? So you have yeah. to go. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, there were about four of us. And so we're in there for a while, you know, because some of us are a little more, <laughs> takes a little longer. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so by the time we get out of there, there's, uh, I guess it was Phil Tallstrup, who was a really, really good player. Uh, Billy Robinson, great player. And myself. And there maybe was, I can't remember, there was maybe somebody else. But I remember the three of us and somebody else were walking out. And, and the game was in Montreal Forum at the time. So we're walking down you know, in the bottom main floor and we got, you got to go upstairs to go outside. So somebody's, this guy's coming in and you can't see him. All you can see is from his, you know, shoulders down. Like how big is this guy coming in? And this guy walks in, it's a big black guy. And it's Wilt Chamberlain. Oh, no way. And, 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 and so Wilt Chamberlain was my hero, my idol for, you know, as a yeah. kid always. Didn't get many NBA games on TV back then. But, of course, yeah. here's this guy who scored 100 points. Yeah, the only guy ever to score that in the NBA. So he walks in, and we're just like, I'm anyway, my eyes are huge. And he walks in, and he recognizes Billy Robinson. He says, oh, hey, you guys, a Canadian team, uh, you know, uh, tough one, you know, congratulations. Shakes our hands, you know. So, like, I don't have very big hands. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> I shake his hand, and his hand is huge. Uh, yeah. I, I, I tell this, story, like, you know Norm Formel. Of course, yeah. He's seven one, and he's got big hands. Well, I always say, well, Norm's hands were dainty compared to Wilt Chamberlain's <laughs> hands. <laughs> like, they're just huge hands, you know. So, little bittersweet, you know, you meet your yeah. idol the day you lose the bronze medal game. But yeah. uh, anyway, wow. it was kind of kind of neat. So, yeah. so was he just there watching the game? Yeah, he'd come to watch the final uh, okay. you know, uh, and, and he'd watch the other one. Like there was time between the bronze medal game and the other. So he just had come to watch the Olympics. And okay. I'm sure okay. I'm sure he had enough money to buy a ticket. And I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. That's such a, yeah, that, yeah that's wild. I've, I've heard that from different people who, shaking NBA players' hands generally, but uh, you, th- you hear about Dr. J, for example, same thing, just massive hands, just like way too big, yeah. even for the, the person yeah. large, but yeah. their hands oh, are yeah. even bigger, you know? And, yeah. so, and he's, a, an, he's he's another hero of mine, Dr. J. I mean, you know, back then on TV, you're, like he was phenomenal. Yeah. So when Jack, when Jack Donahue retired in Ottawa, I was really fortunate, again, the University of Manitoba sent me to Jack's retirement and uh, – Julius Irving was the guest speaker. No way. Yeah, cool. so got to meet Julius Irving there. And then in 2007, I think it was, when the 76 team was inducted into the Canada Basketball Hall of Fame, the guest speaker at that was Dominique Wilkins. No way. <laughs> you know, cool. another another phenomenal dunker. And yeah. So got, yeah. got to meet Dominic, got a picture with him. And, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty neat. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, this is, I mean – just yeah unbelievable i have to ask you this because you know we started off the podcast and you were you know you said hey i stopped playing five years ago and we've mentioned a few times you're you know you're a good athlete you're a runner and jumper when was the last time you dunked a basketball <laughs> I got well, actually actually a couple of weeks ago i did uh, uh richard gooch his granddaughters at naqua place and he was running a great two three four girls uh, basketball camp and Greg Daniels and I were helping him out with this and uh, and Katie Gooch is his daughter the, mm-hmm. the mother of, of uh, uh, Olivia um, mm-hmm. so we lower the rim state feet so I get done okay other than that I, I, I can't recall it's too long <laughs> it's been a while okay okay oh, yeah. so because I remember uh, way back when I think it was um, Clyde Drexler came into to Winnipeg it was something and he was you know it was 50 50 something and he went up and was at a rec center and just dunked the basketball yeah. and like you know and so oh boy a lot, yeah so like you, you said at the start I said what do you do you say you said a lot of it's genetic <laughs> and yeah then, this is a true statement for sure but um you know we're getting close to the end here um you've told us so so many uh crazy stories and just interesting stories and I have to ask you um just kind of as we transition out of here, um, you obviously were offered that opportunity to play pro. And I know back then it was a little bit different, um, but you did go on to play senior men's for a long time. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about, like, I mean, most people don't know, and I, I talked about this through Roth and a few other people as well from your era. They don't understand like 
senior men's model and the national championship and the talent level of the people that were playing essentially was uh, like a pro level experience for lack of a better term or a semi pro level experience as yeah. far as the talent. Right. Mm -hmm. So can you just explain kind of your experience and, and, and kind of uh, maybe your story through senior men's and, and what it meant sure. to you? Yeah. Well, I, I guess back then, uh, you know, when you graduate from university, unless you're going to play in the beer leagues, you know, there wasn't really many opportunities. At, uh, so in 73 for me, uh, I guess, uh, 77 I, I you know I, I played with St Andrews and, and we played uh, um, and we played in national championships and in 75 we won here in Manitoba and that was my first national championships in 76 we won in Victoria and then in 77 it was going to be here again <laughs> and uh, the very first game we're playing against Newfoundland and Ted Stowes is going in for a layup. Why I would rebound, I mean, I don't know, because he's not going to miss it. So both Ross Redlick and I go in to rebound, and Ross catches me with his elbow and Ooh. breaks my jaw. And so I couldn't play the rest of that the rest of that tournament, which was too too bad. I don't know if we would have won or not, but we had a chance to three-peat. And uh, so for athletes now, after university, there isn't a whole lot unless they're really good, but there are players from Bisons and from Westman that are mm -hmm. going to play in Europe in different countries and, uh, and continue their careers there. So there is a bit of an opportunity. But the last year of the senior nationals was in 86. And uh, here in Manitoba, um, I mean, we won in, well, St. Andrews won in 72. We won in 75 and 76 certainly felt we should have won the other years as well because uh, we were good <laughs> we thought, but that's another story and then i think in 78 or 79 nicolette won and they won four years or yeah. you know three or four years in a row so basketball <clears throat> in manitoba was really good like in 76 st andrews won the senior men's and university of manitoba bisons won the uh the, the college uh yeah. championship so, I mean, that kind of gives you an idea. And the toughest games probably both of us had were against each other when we mm -hmm. had exhibit. And I think we played four times and we each won two, two of the matches. So, you know, it was it was really good. And, yeah, the, the level, like, I, I think uh, basketball in Manitoba has done a great job with uh, Winnipeg uh, Minor Basketball League and, and, and all the, the basketball teams that are available for, for people to play. And I know when I go and walk at uh, Dakota and, and, and on the yeah. track upstairs and you, you, you know, there's games going on down below at different levels. And, and, and it's, it's nice to see so many people active and, and still taking part at, at mm -hmm. different levels. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Different, different era for sure. Different uh, opportunities uh, nonetheless. Um, so I want, I want to kind of wrap with this, this, this question. I mean, you've shared uh, so many uh, unbelievable stories and uh, again, just uh uh, giving us some perspective of kind of the journey you've went through. Um, I'd like to finish with asking a question around a piece of advice. Um, and so what I'll, I'll, I'll kind of frame it this way, you know, uh, you got to see Dominique speak and Dr. J speak and all these, I'm sure there's plenty of other people. And now you're now the person sitting in front of maybe some younger kids who would love to play for the national team, who would love to, you know, continue to play until they're, you know, 69 years old and, and just have this long career. And, and you want to leave them with a piece of advice because, you know, you could talk for an hour. They're not going to remember all that. But there's one thing that you do want them to remember and walk away from like, oh, yeah, I remember, you know, Bob said that one thing that really resonated, that really stuck with me. Um, what piece of advice would you would you want them to walk out of that room with? Well, as I said earlier, I think for me, the Pan Am Games in 67 was the start of my <clears throat> belief that maybe there was something further an opportunity for me so i think you have to have that imagination mm. you know the dare to dream you have to have that ambition that um, you need to really want it to to, to be better um and, and certainly the skills the practice you know the work ethic um that commitment the follow-through those are just so important um uh, but 
you're not successful on your own. You, mm-hmm. you need support and, and the support, whether it was from coaches, teammates, um, family, trainers, friends, you know, that, that believe in you and that are supportive of you. I mean, that's very, very important too. The other two pieces that you don't really have a say in, one is genetics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the other is, is good luck. Uh, I, I firmly believe that, that I was really fortunate uh, for the way things worked out for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I was fortunate to have the teammates that I had, the, the coaches that uh, I had, that my teammates certainly made me better. I still have friendships with those, with many of those teammates. Uh, um, I think back personally about, uh, you know, in 75 and 76 in particular, I mean, I mentioned Rick Watts and uh, uh, and Ted Stowe's a number of times. Those are two really, really good players that played the same position that I played. Mm. And why why I was able to make the national team and not them. Because lots of people would say they were better players than me, and, and I couldn't argue with it. They were better shooters than me, that's for sure. Mm. And, and, and And so I was lucky that Jack Donahue, for whatever reason – chose me instead of Rick or Ted and they were unfortunate in that, that, that. so a lot of it has to do with luck and uh, and I've been pretty lucky in life all told uh, Darcy yeah. so I I, yeah. you know, I I can't complain whatsoever that's for sure yeah. yeah yeah well I appreciate your time Bob it's uh it's been wonderful just to hear hear the story um and uh you know like I I, I kind of open up the podcast with this you know in the community we know people, hey, I know Bob Town, hey, I know his sons, hey, I know he was a good basketball player, I know he played there, but we don't often hear like how it felt and and what you remember. And so this is the important part about about this is uh, giving people a chance to peer into uh, what it is you experienced and how you experienced it. So I appreciate you taking the time to to be so open and and share just the, the journey of basketball. So thank you. Well, thank you. You may want to cut this out of the, the thing, but like I remember in grade 12, you were in grade 11 at Glenlawn. Yeah. And you were a good player. Uh, and, and I know became an even better player. So Sean, my oldest son, was playing for Glenlawn at the time. And uh, they were going to play Maples in the Provincials. And unfortunately, you were unable to play that game. I remember and, that, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and I still firmly believe that if you had been able to play that game, <laughs> Glenn Long would have knocked off Maples and, and uh, you guys would have gone further on into, uh, into provincial. So that was uh, unfortunate, Darcy. And, and uh, yeah. I, I know you've done very well with your, uh, your career, too, in basketball, I think, has been pretty good to you, too. So that's, uh, that's good has. to see. I'm, I'm really happy for you. So yeah, anyway, I appreciate keep up that. The, keep up the good work. No, thank you so much. You have a sharp memory. That's a, that's a, that's a good, you have a sharp so, memory. So far. <laughs> so far, yeah. Well, you know, like, uh, I, I definitely couldn't tell half the stories the way you could. So I appreciate the kind words so much. And, and really it is, um, I'm so grateful just to be able to sit and, and be in the position I'm in right now, just listening to you share your story and, and be part of the process. So I, again, like, I really do thank you for being part of this. Thanks, Darcy. I appreciate being awesome. invited. Awesome. Okay. okay. Take care, Bob. You too. All right. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Please like, subscribe, follow, and share this series, and reach out to us with your comments on the show. Thanks again for joining us.